it's Miss Miklos here, and um, today we're going to cross this off. We are doing 1.2, not 1.1, 1 .1. um, and we're going to be talking about functions, and there is a note handout, as you can clearly see on this video, so um, feel free to um, go into Blackboard and download that so you can follow along. So um, we're going to be talking about functions, and the first thing I want to do is kind of define what a function actually is. For every input, there is exactly one output. And often we think about this mathematically, but I actually want to take a moment to think about this in terms of the real world. So we're going to talk about the best baseball player in the entire world, Mike Trout. And um, Mike Trout, or any particular player, he is like the input. Okay, if I'm looking up stats at this point in time, Mike Trout has exactly one batting average at this point in time. So if I was looking up stats right now, um, it would tell me Mike Trout is hitting 305. Now, Mike Trout is only hitting 305 at this moment. He's not hitting anything else. But it would be okay if more than one player was hitting 305. So we're kind of seeing this one input has exactly one output, but more than one input could have the same output. The next thing I want to talk about is your license plate. Uh, my guess is a lot of you guys probably have a car that you drive at home and whether you're lucky enough that it's yours or if it's your parents' car, it has a license plate on it. And let's say that um, you got caught speeding by the cops. They would type in your license plate number and your address would come up. Okay, so your license plate is the input and your address is the output. Okay, so it's okay that you have more than one car at your house, but the license plate is only going to be mapped to one specific address, even though multiple cars may go to the same address. So each input has exactly one output. I'm one of those weirdos who always likes looking up what the temperature is going to be so I can, pl so I can plan my outfits accordingly. And um, so another good example of input is looking at time. If I look at a specific time, it will map to a specific temperature. So um, it might tell me that at 6 p.m. tonight, it's still going to be 88 degrees outside. Okay, and at that specific time, there's only one temperature. Each input only has one output. So bottom line, we normally think each X only has one Y value. And you know mathematicians, they are a cool bunch of people but they like order, so they want a rule that goes along with this function. So we use a few terms quite a bit, um, domain and range. And we're gonna start by talking about the domain. Um, we use domain all the time, and in um, our next lecture, that's going to be even more important. But um, domain means all of the x values. Okay, so when we're talking about domain, we're talking about x's. We also think of this as the input. Okay, like I was talking about earlier, Mike Trout is the domain. The time is the domain. We also refer to this as the independent variable. And you guys will hear this a lot in science, but the reason why we call it the independent variable is because this is the variable that we can control and we can make it whatever we want. Now the range on the other hand is talking about all of the y values. So domain are the x values, range are the y values. Notice it goes in alphabetical order. D for domain comes before R for range, X comes before Y. I don't know, dumb things help me learn. Okay, so the range are all the Y values. This is also the output. That was like the batting average or the temperature. It is also the dependent variable. And the reason why we call it the dependent variable is because the value of this variable depends upon what we chose for the independent variable.
not every relation is a function. So there's actually um, a few different tests that we will use to see if something is a function or not. The first is to just look if we have ordered pairs. If the problem just gives us a ton of ordered pairs, we know that the x value cannot repeat. If the x value repeats, that then it is not a function. For example, if we had an ordered pair of 2, 0 and an ordered pair of 2, 1, that is not a function because the input 2 would have more than one output. The second thing we will do, we call mapping, and I'm going to go through an example of that in a moment. But um, when we're mapping, it is a function if each input has exactly one output. And I just want to clarify here that we do not need to do all of these tests. We only need to use one of these tests, and um, I would choose, well, either what the directions are telling me to do, or whatever I think is the easiest and quickest in order to determine if it is a function or not. If we have a graph, we're going to use what we call the vertical line test. And what the vertical line test is, I'm going to get out a really cool vertical line. In fact, it's so cool. It is a lightsaber. There we go. But my whole point here is if I had a graph, I could use this and go straight across. And I know that every point, my weapon here should only be touching that particular um, function once. If for some reason two points are touching this line at the time, then I know that it would not be a function. The final method, and I'm actually going to put a little star by this because for most of you this is the only new method, um, is to isolate the dependent variable. So if we're dealing with x and y, um, I would get um, the dependent variable being y all by itself and check and see if it's going to work. So let's go ahead and try this method out. So I'm going through two functions and um, the first one is going to be y equals x squared plus 1. We notice y is already isolated. So if I substituted something in like, let's make x equal to 1. I would get 1 squared plus 1, which is 2. Notice that's the only option that I could possibly get. And if I substituted in any value, it would be similar. So we would say that something like this is a function. Now, on the other hand, my second equation, y equals plus or minus the square root of x plus 1. If I put in x equals 1, I would get y equals plus or minus the square root of 1 plus 1. So I would get that 1 maps to the square root of 2, and 1 also maps to negative square root 2. So in this case, I can see that this 1 input is going to 2 different outputs. So we would say that that is not a function. So let's actually get into some problems here. It's asking us, is this relation a function and a relation is any set of ordered pairs and these first problems are going to show us how to use the mapping option so here we have our input in our, the first oval and we have the output in the second oval and what this is telling us is that each of these values is mapped by this arrow to an output okay so we can see negative 2 goes to 5 negative 1 goes to 8, 0 goes to 6, 1 also goes to 6, and I'm trying to find some pretty colors here, and 2 is mapped to 7. So the question we need to ask ourselves is does each input only have one output? Does each input number only have one arrow coming from it? And our answer here is obviously yes. So we could say yes, this is a function, or I'm just going to write function. If we look at number two, um, we're going to try and map the input and the output again. Notice negative two goes to three. Negative one goes to three. Zero goes to four. And if you notice, I skipped one because 
There's another arrow coming from negative 1. That's also going to 4. 1 is going to 5. And 2 is also going to 5. And keep in mind, um, remember, it does not matter if an output value has more than one arrow coming, from, coming to it. What does matter is, is there a number in the input where there's more than one arrow coming from it? And we can see that negative 1 has two different arrows coming from it. So we would say that this is not a function. So let's talk a little bit more about what we call function notation. And you guys saw this last year, but if we look at this very first thing, y equals, and then it lo looks like f parenthesis x parenthesis, we actually read this as f of x. And a few things that I want to point out. We would say that the name of this function is f. And often we will see f of x, g of x, h of x, k of x. It doesn't matter. It's still function notation. But that is the particular name of the function. Our dependent variable here is y or f of x, because we know that f of x means the same thing as y. The independent variable is x. So that means whenever it's in this notation, our independent variable is whatever's inside the parentheses. And we would say that f of x is the value of the function at x. So that's a little bit about function notation. The next thing we're going to work on um, is finding the domain of these ordered pairs or these equations. Um, these are all for the most part functions, so um, based on the information given to us, we're going to have to use a slightly different way to figure it out. We already talked about the fact that domain is talking about the x values. Um, what we really need to keep in mind is that the domain is all the x values, but it cannot cause division by zero or the square root of a negative number, because we know the square root of a negative number means that things would be imaginary. So those are the things that we're going to have to think about when we look at each problem on a case-by-case -case scenario. So let's look at number three here. Number three is the easiest case because it's just ordered pairs. Okay, so um, we could write that the domain is negative 3, negative 1, 0, and 4. And I know this is the domain because all we did is take the x values of each of the ordered pairs. Number 4 is a little bit different because as we can see this is an equation. So since it's an equation we need to think a little bit more about it. And the first thing that I would look for is is there anything that could cause division by zero, or is there anything that could cause the square root of a negative number? And clearly I can see here there's not a square root, so that is not going to be an option. So what I'm going to do is set the denominator equal to zero. So I'm going to write x plus 5 equals zero. So x is equal to negative 5. And this obviously is a simple problem where most of you guys could figure that out without writing everything down. But if we know that, what this is telling us is that negative 5 is the only x value that will cause division by 0. Now what makes this different than number 3 is there's no possible way that we can list out every x value because there are an infinite number of x values that are in our domain. For example, 4, 4.1, 4.11, 4.73, 4.999, okay, and the list goes on and on and on. So we're going to learn a new way to go ahead and label um, our domain, and we're going to be using this in our notes next class as well. So the method that we are using is called interval notation, and interval notation is a way that is going to include all of the different x values, and um, there's a few symbols that we need to know when we're using interval notation. The first is that whenever a number is not included in the domain, we're going to use a parenthesis to represent that. And what that's saying is that all the numbers leading up to that value are in the domain. 
If something is included in the domain, then I would use a bracket to represent that. In general, we always go from the left answer to the right answer. So if we're looking specifically at this problem, we saw that x is equal to negative 5. So what that means for our domain is that the smallest x value would be negative infinity up until we hit negative 5. So that's telling me that everything between negative infinity and negative 5 is in our domain. Now I know negative 5 for sure is going to be a parenthesis because it does not include negative 5. Negative 5 makes our denominator 0. The key thing I need to remember here is whenever we have infinity we also use a parenthesis. And the reason is because infinity is a number that we never actually reach. So we go ahead and we write that as a parenthesis. I definitely did not mean to squiggle a line there. Now, we're not done here yet because we also know that the numbers between negative 5 and positive infinity are also part of this domain. And whenever we have two separate pieces to a domain like this, we're going to use a symbol that is a U, and we call this a union, and that is going to connect the two different parts of our domain. So this would be our answer, and if I see this, I can see this is telling me every x value from negative infinity up to negative 5, not including negative 5, and then every x value not including negative 5 all the way to positive infinity will all work in this particular equation. If we look at number 5, number 5 looks unique because this does not have um, something that's going to cause division by 0. It also does not have um, anything that's going to cause a square root of a negative number. But I do notice that this is a formula. And when we have a specific, a specific formula, there are different restrictions that are put on these values. For example, r has to be the radius. It looks like radians that I wrote, but that really is radius. That's a u there. I just made it look worse, but... Okay, hopefully we can see that's a radius. And something that we know about the radius is that it must be a positive value. And we know it has to be a positive value because a negative radius does not exist. A radius is a distance, and we know that distance always has to be positive. In this case, even though it doesn't have an x, I can see by the way that this equation is written that r is our independent variable. So for our domain, we're saying that r has to be greater than 0. So I know that it cannot be 0, but it's everything leading up to 0 all the way to positive infinity. So whenever we have a formula, we need to think a little bit about what those variables actually represent. Number six, we can clearly see that we have a square root. And we said the square root cannot have a negative number inside. So that tells me that whatever the expression 4 minus x is equal to has to be greater than or equal to 0. Because it's okay to take the square root of 0. We can't take the square root of a negative value. So I'm going to go ahead and solve this. And I need to remember that when I divide by a negative 1, I need to switch my inequality symbol here. So this is telling me that all values less than or equal to 4 are going to be in this domain. So that means values starting at negative infinity would, would work in this domain. And if you're unsure, try a number. Like if I tried like negative 10. If I substituted that in for x, I would get 4 minus negative 10, which would be 14. That's a positive value, so it's okay. It's leading all the way up until we hit 4, and this time, since it says less than or equal to, I'm going to actually use a bracket there because 4 is included in our domain. So our domain is from negative infinity to 4, including 4. Our last problem with this set of directions is another equation, and if we notice, 
It's not a formula, okay? It's just X and Y. It is not um, going to be something that causes division by zero. It's not something that's going to cause a square root of a negative number. And so if we really wanted to, we could go ahead and we can just say that any X value is going to work. So our domain here, is going to be all the way from negative infinity to infinity. And just to clarify once again what that actually means, that means that I can substitute any number in for x and it will give me an output. It will give me a y value. Our last set of information um, for this lesson is going to be evaluating functions at the specified values. So it gives us f of x, g of x, and h of x, and we're going to start with this first problem, which is f of 3. What this is telling me to do is substitute in for x in function f. I know it's in function f because it says f, and whatever's inside the parentheses is my input. So if we look at this equation, this is the equation that we are using. Wherever there's an x, I'm replacing it with a 3 because that is our new input. So I'm going to go ahead and say 2 times 3 minus 5. So I get 6 minus 5, which is 1. For f of 6, we're doing the same exact thing, except this time, instead of substituting in 3, I'm going to substitute in 6. So 2 times 6 minus 5, which is 7. f of negative 8 means that I'm substituting negative 8 wherever there was an x. So I'm going to write 2 times negative 8 minus 5, which is negative 21. And last but not least, it says f of a. And this looks kind of weird, but what this is telling us to do it's telling me to replace that x with an a. So instead of 2x minus 5, I'm going to write 2a minus 5. Now this time, there's nothing else that I can do with that. I don't have any like terms to combine, so that would be our answer. Moving on, this one says g of 2. That means I'm using function g this time. And I'm only putting 2 in wherever there is an x. So I'm going to go ahead and write 3 times 2 squared minus the absolute value of 2. And one thing that I want to point out here is that I'm using parentheses whenever I use substitution or some sort of grouping symbol. Now for absolute value, that's already a grouping symbol, so I don't need to write parentheses down. But the reason why that's important is because it could possibly affect our order of operations, which we'll see in the next problem. So if I'm going through this, I know 3 times 2 squared is 4. The absolute value is, of 2 is 2. So I really have 12 minus 2, which is 10. Now if I'm putting in g of negative 2, I would do 3 times negative 2 squared minus the absolute value of negative 2. And the reason why this matters, if I square this negative value, it becomes positive 4. If I had just squared the opposite of 2 and did not have parentheses around it, then I would get negative 4 as my answer. So I have 3 times 4. I know absolute value is the distance something is away from 0. So negative 2 is 2 away from 0. So once I get in, I get 10. And remember, it's okay to get the same output. It's just that each input can only have one output. Lastly for g, I have g of a. So I'm going to write 3 instead of x squared. I have a squared minus the absolute value of a. So when we have... Um, a normal equation, it really is that simple to do it. Now, moving on to h, we're going to see something a little bit different. What looks strange about h of x is that it appears like we have two different equations. However, we only have one equal sign, so that means we only have one equation. It's just given a very specific name. 
We call this a piecewise function. And it's important for us to realize that the x is less than or x is greater than is talking about the domain. So what this is telling me is that if x is less than 0, I'm substituting only into this first expression. If x is greater than or equal to 0, then I'm only substituting into this second expression. Since this is a function, I know that for any input, I only have one output. So I should only have one answer every single time. And that's probably the most common mistake I see, so please check on that. So let's look at this, h of 2. If I'm comparing 2 with 0, we would say 2 is greater than 0. So if I look, this first equation, or I'm, what am I saying? This second expression here is where I'm supposed to substitute in if x is greater than or equal to 0. So instead of mm. x minus 1, I'm going to say 2 minus 1, which is 1. Even though we haven't talked about this, another way we could think about this is we actually found an ordered pair. With 2, the input being the x value, and 1, the output being the y value. And we really could have done that on any of the problems that we've seen so far. h of negative 2. I think we would all agree if we're comparing negative 2 and 0, negative 2 is less than 0. So if I look at our function, this first expression is what I need to use if our number is less than 0. So instead of x squared plus 1, I'm going to write the quantity negative 2 squared plus 1, which ends up being 5. And last but not least, we have 0. And if we're comparing 0 with 0, and, and just kind of to emphasize this again, the reason why I'm choosing 0 here on the right side of my inequality is because that was the number here this number will always be the same. If this said 1, then I would compare our inputs to 1. If it said negative 7, I would compare the inputs to negative 7. Since 0 is equal to 0, I need to use the second expression. And I'm going to go ahead and say then, instead of x minus 1, 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. So a lot of what we discussed today should have been reviewed for you guys from Algebra 2 with a few new additions. Um, starting next lesson, we're really jumping into some new stuff. So please make sure that you guys are feeling confident on this material.